His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jayam Vishnupad Paramahansa Padibra Jakacharya, Asto Tadasata Sisi Mad. His divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada Ki. Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda Ki. Namacharja Srila Haridas Thakur Ki. Prem Sikaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunatananda Shri Dvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Ki. 
Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gogopina Sham Kun Radha Kun Giri Gurdan Ki Brinda Vindam Ki Mayapur Navadip Dam Ki Ganga Maya Ki Jamuna Maya Ki Bhakti Devi Ki Tulsi Maharani Ki Sambir Bhakti Rinda Ki Shri Shri Gornatai Ki Krishna Balaram Ki Radha Sham Sundar Ki Srila Prabhupada Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki, Nitai Gop Premanandi, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga Hari Hari Bo. Good morning, everyone. Hare Krishna. Is everyone doing okay? Yes. Is everyone dry? No. <laughs> Last night I came for Bada Hari Prabhu's kirtan, and. Uh, and I saw a number of the men who had been sitting and then they were standing and dancing and the backs of their kurtas were wet and I assume their dhotis were also. We hope that you stay dry. Last year we had the opportunity to speak on, well, before I speak about that. I'd like to say that um, it's a pleasure for me to be with all of you here at New Govardhan. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me again this year. I'd like to thank uh, Srila Gurudev for inviting me to come over here and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, Many times I've mentioned before that um, that uh, Gurudev engages me in these activities, and many times I question. I don't know why he does, because I feel myself to be very incompetent. But um, I can understand his position as he's engaging me in these activities so that I can become purified. Is that Ramdi? Hare Krishna. Welcome. So I thank Gurudev for bringing me here and, uh, and I thank all of you all for having me come over here. And um, naturally I thank Srila Prabhupada for engaging me in this service. Lalita, is that you? <laughs> wow. And I thank uh, Srila Sanatan Goswami for giving us this wonderful literature, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Prabhupada has written that if any of us wish to go to Goloka Vrindavan, we must study the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. He says that when he's giving his description and his introduction to the uh, to Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, and he says, "This is really, if we have a desire to go to Goloka, we have to study this book." 
And uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Ritam is a story of a, of a quest. It's the story of a, a, a hero on a journey to find some great attainment, to undertake something which would seem normally inconceivable. As, as Gopi Puranadana Prabhu, he writes, you know, it's like a hero's quest to find the, the holy grail. You see, to, to find something which is beyond our understanding. And, um, and these types of stories, they always inspire us to hear somebody taking up a challenge and then attaining their goal. And it's an inspiration for all of us as well because we have taken up a challenge. We have taken up something which is practically in inconceivable. And that is that in this lifetime, or in many lifetimes, that we'll understand our eternal loving relationship with Krishna and then go to Krishna's abode and serve Krishna and play with Krishna in that abode. I can remember many, many long years ago, maybe 1992 or 1993, I had the opportunity to be with uh, Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj when he came to Budapest for a few days. And, uh, and Shri Ram Maharaj and I were sitting with Gorgovinda Maharaj and we were, we were discussing. And, and I mentioned to him, I said, so like the goal of our chanting and the goal of our you know, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam and the goal of our studying the literatures of the Goswamis is so that we will understand Krishna's activities in the spiritual world. And he smiled and he said, yes. He said, but not only to understand Krishna's activities in Goloka Vrindavan, but to understand who you are and Krishna's activities. So that's really a great quest. Because at the present time we're all living in our in our conditioned consciousness and we're identifying with the material atmosphere. And we have so many different conceptions of what we are within this world. But the quest of our journey in Krishna consciousness is to go beyond all of the material conceptions and understand who we are as Krishna's eternal servant. Now we're in a position of <coughs> theoretical understanding where if any of us are asked who are you you know we'll say we're Krishna's servants but then the next question comes well if you're Krishna's servant which servant of Krishna are you what is your seva to Krishna what is your name what is your attire? What village do you come from? You know? Like Lalita. When Lalita was a child, she lived in Vrindavan. She lived in the back corner of the ground floor 
of the girl Kula. And she was just little at that time. And uh, her name is Lolita Manjari, right? And back then in Vrindavan, I would always grow my whiskers. And, uh, and I would shave my whiskers like once a month, or once every two weeks. And, and back then, before everything went gray, we, uh, I had a kind of a red beard. And so I would say, you're Lolita Manjari. And she would say, you're Lal Dari Manjari. <laughs> Lal Dari means like you're red, red beard Manjari. <laughs> so understanding who we are. And we understand by reading Srila Prabhupada's books. And we understand by reading the books of the Goswamis that in the spiritual world, there are different relationships that we have with Krishna. One can have the relationship in neutrality. One can have a relationship as a servant. One can have a relationship as a friend. One can have a relationship in the parental mood. And then one can have a relationship as one of Krishna's lovers. So this is the quest to understand who we are and who we are in Krishna's activities and what is our service to Krishna. So last year when we spoke, the quest was to understand who, what devotees, which devotees have received the greatest extreme amount of Krishna's mercy and why. So that quest was undertaken by Narada Muni. And I don't know how many of you were here last year, but we spoke of Narada's quest. And Narada was trying to understand who is the best devotee. So Narada, he started traveling. And he started traveling throughout the universes and he started traveling beyond the universe to the spiritual world as well. And he would meet great Vaishnavas. And when he would meet great Vaishnavas, he would be overwhelmed in ecstasy upon meeting the Vaishnav. And he would proclaim, you are the greatest devotee of the Lord. You have received the extreme limit of Krishna's mercy. And then the Vaishnavas would always reply, excuse me, sir, I'm not the greatest devotee. I'm not even a devotee. But if you want to find a devotee, go to this person. And so then his quest would continue. And he would go to the next person and the next person and the next person until he went to Dwarka in the spiritual sky and he approached the Yadavas and the Yadavas told him, the best of us all is Uddhava, and he went to Uddhava, and then that entire situation unfolded that we described last year. <clears throat> and it was revealed at that time that the greatest devotees of the Lord are the young ladies of Vrindavan, because they always serve Krishna in the mood of separation. And, uh, and Narada felt great ecstasy when he understood that point. Of course, he created a sensation in Dwarka. He created, created quite a, quite a you know, agitated atmosphere and some extreme things had to be done. And after he did that, he felt very shy. And, and Krishna saw him, and Krishna said, and he, Narada, because he felt shy, he wouldn't go into Krishna's house, although he'd been there thousands of times before. And um, Krishna said, Narada, please come. Why are you standing at my door? Why aren't you coming in? And Uddhava said, Lord, he feels shy. 
because he feels that he has committed an offense by reminding you of your devotees in Vrindavan and this whole explosion took place in Dwarka. And Krishna told Narada, he said, Narada, you haven't committed an offense. He said, Narada, when you love a person, naturally, you always think of a person. He said, but when a person comes and reminds you of those who you love, he said, then you feel much more grateful. So you've reminded me of the residents of Vrindavan, therefore I'm very appreciative. He said, come, let's take prasadam. And no, before he said, come, let's take prasadam, he looked at Narada and he said, he said, I'm not offended. I'm very thankful. And because I'm so thankful that you've reminded me of the ladies of Vrindavan, I want to give you a benediction. And so Narada was in ecstasy, you know, that Krishna was going to give a benediction. And so he said, please, Narada, ask for a benediction. And uh, Narada thought, then the first benediction he asked for, he said, Lord, he said, I want this benediction. I would like the benediction that if anyone engages in your devotional service, they will never feel satisfied and that they'll always want to engage in more devotional service. And Krishna laughed and he said, Narada, why are you asking such a thing? Because everybody knows that that's the nature of my devotional service. The more you perform, the more you want. The more you chant, the more you want to chant. It's like one time I was in New Vrajadam in Hungary, and we had a kirtan that was something like seven or eight hours long. And then uh, His Holiness Sri Ramaraj, she looked up and he said, those who are drunkards will drink to their death. <laughs> And, uh, and devotional service is like that. The more you do, you're never satisfied. You want more, and you want more, and you want more. So Krishna said, that's the nature of my service, Narada. Why are you asking for such a benediction like that? He said, ask for another benediction. And so Narada, he got into ecstasy. And Narada... <clears throat> He asked the Lord, he said, Lord, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. I would like this benediction. And he said, I would like the benediction that you will bless me, that forever I may travel throughout all of the universes, engaging in your Nam Sankirtan and describing your glories. And that if anybody hears that Nam Sankirtan, and if anybody hears those glories, they will be benefited. So it's very beautiful that Narada, he asked for the benediction, Lord, please, let me preach eternally. Let me always travel, and let me chant, but let me chant for the purpose that all of the conditioned souls of this world will become benefited. When Krishna heard his request, Krishna folded his hands and he said, yes, take it. And Krishna was so satisfied, he said, ask for one more benediction. <laughs> and, you know, Narada, naturally, he was in ecstasy that the, that the best of all benediction givers was sort of giving him a carte blanche. And uh, Narada thought, and Arda said, this is the benediction I would like. I would like the benediction that if there is anyone who has heard the story that has been described here, if anyone has heard of the activities of Krishna with his most beloved devotees in Vrindavan, he said, I pray that you will bless those people 
to eternally be engaged in devotional service. And Krishna said, Tatastu. He said, take that blessing. And then he said, now let's take prasadam. <laughs> Maybe one day you'll be able to be there to cook RP. You can make Krishna some nice pizza rolls. <laughs> and uh, so they sat down to take prasadam. But Narada was so overwhelmed with ecstasy and his understanding, the goal of his quest, who are the greatest devotees of the Lord, that he couldn't eat. And, you know, Rukmini kept coming and Rukmini kept saying, you know, Narada, you know, you like the sweet rice, eat more sweet rice. And, uh, and other queens were coming and they said, Narada, this is your favorite subji, eat it. But he couldn't eat. And finally he just jumped up and he said, Krishna, I'm going. And he said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going throughout all of the worlds to explain to them that I have understood who are the greatest devotees of the Lord. So that was last year's quest. And this year's quest is another wonderful thing. And that quest is a quest of um, a young cowherd from Vrindavan, and his name is Gop Kumar. And Gop Kumar is going to explain to us, hopefully over the next few days, a wonderful topic. And it's a topic that all of us, as practicing devotees, should be interested in. And that topic is sadhya and sadhana. Sadhya means the goal, and sadhana means the process to attain the goal. And this should be very important for all of us. What is the goal of our practice? And what is the sadhana that we must undertake to achieve that goal? It's like a few days ago I was listening to Srila Prabhupada speak while I was doing my puja. And Srila Prabhupada, he was, it was one of the nectar devotion classes. And Srila Prabhupada was talking about the discussion between Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Roy. And, and Prabhupada was saying, this discussion entails sajja and sadhana. Sajja and sadhana. Sajja and sadhana. What is the goal of life? What is the highest goal of life? Because there are many goals. But what is the ultimate highest goal of life? And what is the process to attain it? And we know even in that discussion, when Lord Chaitanya was speaking to Ramananda Roy, Lord Chaitanya, he said, what is the goal of life? What is the process to attain it? And Ramananda Roy began describing many different things, such as performing duties and engaging in Varnashram and performing activities selflessly. And Lord Chaitanya would listen, he would say, this is nice, but echo baya, it's external. Please, if you know something more, tell me. And Lord Chaitanya didn't start to become satisfied until Ramananda Roy described the verse that's spoken by Lord Brahma in his prayers, where Lord Brahma says, in order to attain perfection, he said, he said, first, you don't have to change your position. Whatever position you're in in society, whether you're a family man or whether you're a brahmachari or a renunciate, you don't have to change your position to attain perfection. He said, it is necessary that you give up the process of mental speculation because trying to understand the absolute by the speculations of the mind will take us nowhere. But he said the most important thing is that if you wish to attain perfection, 
you should always hear the topics of Krishna from devotees who have a taste for speaking of the topics of Krishna. He said, if you do that, Krishna, who is Ajita, he is unconquerable. Just by hearing, undertaking the process of hearing, then Krishna will become conquered by your love. Lord Chaitanya said, this I like. He said, if you know something more, please speak. And so, the goal and the process to attain the goal. So, Sanatana Goswami begins to explain this. And the background is, uh, the background is this. This story was, um, Sanatana Goswami says, it's not my story. He says, this is a very ancient story. He said, this story was spoken by Jamini Rishi to Maharaj Janmajaya. And uh, Jaimini Rishi, he's a great Vedic sage. And Jaimini was responsible for many departments of knowledge in the Vedic age. But he was so, such an exalted sage that when um, Padikshit Maharaj was cursed to die, and he went to the banks of the, the Ganga, then uh, Shukdev Goswami came, and so many, there was such an assembly of saints and sages, and Shukdev Goswami personally arranged that Jaimini would sit just behind Parikshit Maharaj, so that Jaimini would hear the entire discussion that was taking place. He wanted, because he was so qualified, he wanted Jaimini to hear very, very clearly what he was saying, so that later Jaimini could repeat it. And Maharaj Janmajaya, he's the son of Pariksit Maharaj. And so, you know, after the first part of Narada's quest was described, then, you know, Jaimini was saying, excuse me, Maharaj Janmajaya was saying, tell me more. Tell me more, what happened next? What happened next? You know. And then Jaimini Rishi says, well, Parikshit Maharaj, he spoke the first part to his mother Uttara. Oh, no, and this is another part of the background. <laughs> Excuse me. Another part of the background is this whole story is being told after, after Shukadeva Goswami has spoken to Maharaj Parikshit, and Maharaj Parikshit has a few moments before he's going to, the curse of the Brahman is going to take place and he's going to die, then he's got a few moments to, to prepare himself for death. And then his mother Uttara rushes in and she says, Son, what did the sage tell you? What did he tell you? Please share it with me. And Maharaj Parikshit, he can't refuse his mother. So he tells the whole story in this form. So Parikshit Maharaj explained to Uttara the whole quest of, you know, Narada. And then he is, now I will die. You know, snake bird is coming to get me. And then Uttara says, look, you have explained to me who the greatest devotees of the Lord are. And you've explained to me that the greatest devotees of the Lord are the gopis of Vrindavan. And you've told me that they're the greatest devotees because they always serve Krishna in the mood of separation. Even if they're not with Krishna, they're so much absorbed in the thought of Krishna that Krishna is with them. You've explained how exalted these ladies are, how pure they are, how 
unparalleled is their devotion. So my son, I have another question. And you have to answer it for me before you go. And he says, yes, mother. <laughs> yes, Mataji. <laughs> and she says, they're so exalted. Where do they live? They are such exalted Vaishnavas. They must have a special abode where they live. And then, I've got my notes, but it's between the notepad and the computer. And my handwriting is horrible. And the computer, it keeps asking for a password. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> she says, son, where do they live? What kind of abode do they live in? And then, you know, she looks at him and she says, please, my dear son. She said, they can't, they can't live anywhere in this world. She said, here we have the lower, the middle, and the upper planets. Swargaloka, Bhur Bhuvaswa. But these places are inhabited primarily by, by people who are, who are performing Vedic rituals. And they simply want to have opulence and a heavenly situation in their lives or in their next lives. But that's all temporary. They can't live in that place. And she says, and beyond Swargaloka, there are the higher planets of heaven. She says, there's a planet called Maharloka. Maharloka is inhabited by perfect grihastas. And those perfect grihastas who who perform their duties for thousands of lifetimes and they're absolutely perfected, they live in Maharloka and they worship the Lord by the performance of sacrifice. And she says, and beyond Maharloka, there's Janaloka and there's Tapaloka. And in Tapaloka, she says, you know, you have realized brahmacharis, realized ascetics like the four kumaras, they live there. And she says, even the highest planet of the material world, Satyaloka, that's the planet of Lord Brahma, and it's inhabited by, by the Vedas personified. They live there. But that's still not good enough for them. And then there are the planets of Vaikuntha. But they have a different type of love for Krishna. Where do these people live? Where do these girls live? Where do these people from, you know, this Braja Bhav, this Braja love, where do they live? I want to hear that. And Parikshit Maharaj is checking his watch. <laughs> He's saying, snake birds coming. <laughs> Time is running out. But he looks at his mother and he says, Mother, your question is so excellent. No one has ever asked a question like that before. She said, he said, therefore, in the short time I have left, I will try to give you an answer. And so she becomes satisfied. And he begins to speak. And, uh, now I have to get, do the password thing. Uh, oh lordy, I thought we were supposed to go till nine. I only have ten minutes. Well, 
be more careful tomorrow. Um, Brigitte Mirage begins to tell the story. And he starts, he tells his mother, he said, he said, mother, I could answer your question by giving you reference from the Shruti and the Smriti. I can ask your question very nicely from Shastra. He says, but I would prefer to tell you a story that I heard from my Guru Maharaj. And it's a nice story, and it's a long story. And, uh, then, and so then he says, so I will answer in that way. And before he begins to speak, he gives his obeisance to his spiritual master, Shukadeva Goswami. And, uh, and then he begins his story. And he's his mother. There was once an ignorant Brahmin. And his family originally hailed from Mathura. But his family his family had migrated to Assam, up in the northeast, up above Bengal. He said this Brahman was ignorant of any Shastra. And this Brahman, he was looking for material wealth in life. And he was frustrated. So he would go to a temple of Durga Devi. And that Devi, she's known as Kamakya Devi. I actually did a Google search on Kamakya Devi. <laughs> and uh, Kamakya, I think even up to like 150 years ago, they used to perform human sacrifices to Kamakya Devi. It's a very very interesting form of Durga Devi. And this Brahman, he went to Devi and he was praying to Devi, please help me, please help me, please help me to somehow or other attain my goal in life. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do it. Davy, please help me. Davy, please help me. And he would pray to Davy that way all the time. And then one night, while he was sleeping, Davy came to him in his dream. And Davy said, My dear Brahman, I have a mantra that I would like for you to chant. It is a ten-syllable mantra. If you chant this mantra, you will attain the highest goal of life. And the mantra that she gave him was Gopi Jana Balabaya Swaha. And so the ignorant Brahman accepted this mantra of the Lord's name, Gopi Jana Balabha. And it is the mantra for worshipping Sri Manad Gopal in Vrindavan. And he began chanting. And then by the power and the effect of chanting the mantra, his life started to change. And I think each and every one of us here have that experience. We receive the mantra, we receive the mantra from our spiritual masters. We begin to chant, and our lives begin to change.
we start to see a different goal of life. We begin to see a different direction in life. The Brahmin started to become detached. He started thinking, no, this attainment of material things is so hopeless. All of those things are going to go away. Like I can remember when I was young, I went to see my father before he was going to pass away. And I was a devotee at that time. He told me, son, he said, I had seven children. He said, and I've been very, very successful in life. He said, but now death is upon me. And all of the material things that I strove so hard to achieve in my life, he said, they're just going through my fingers like water. He said, there's no way I can hold on. He said, son, I think I chose the wrong goal in life. So the Brahman, he started thinking, no, material things are hopeless. And then he started to wander. He left his home. He left his home and he started traveling. And first, he went to uh, the Sundarban in Bengal, where the Ganga flows into the ocean. And there they have a big mela, which is called the Ganga Sagar Mela. And he went there, and he met Brahmins. But these Brahmins, they were all Brahmins who were engaged in performing Vedic rituals for the purpose of being happy in this life and going to heaven in the next life. And he said, this is nice. I like this. They're giving me some duties to perform. So he lived there with the Brahmins for a while, but he never stopped chanting his mantra. He said, I would do what the Brahmins would say to do, but in seclusion, I would always make sure I was chanting Gopi Jana Balabhaya Swaha in Japa. He said, I always chanted the mantra that Devi gave me. After a while, he said, this is not interesting, just performance of duties. And then he left that place. The next place that he went was to Baranasi, or Kashi. In Kashi, there they, everybody is the worshiper of Kashi Vishwanath. They worship Lord Shiva. And, uh, and the people who were there, they're all sannyasis. But they're sannyasis who were following the, the Advaita Vedantic system of monism. They're Mayavadis. And he stayed there for some time. And he said, I enjoyed being in their company. He said, the reason that I enjoyed being in their company is because they were all speaking Vedas and they were all speaking Puranas and they were speaking so nicely. And they had good food. <laughs> and I could get food for free over there. He said, so I enjoyed it. He said, I would stay there and I would listen to their discussions. He said, but never did I stop chanting my mantra. He said, I was chanting and chanting and chanting. He said, and after some time, this concept, by the power of my mantra, I could understand this entire concept of liberation was not so appealing. And then he said, my next stop was uh, Prayag. He said, I went to the, I went to the Kumbha Mela, or the, the Mag Mela. And he said, when I reached there, he said, this big festival was going on. And the festival was completely filled with Vaishnavas. And the Vaishnavas, <coughs> they, no, 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 excuse me. When he 
was in Kashi, he was staying there, and, and, and he was hearing all these talks, and the prashadam was so good, or the food was so good, and whatever they were eating. But he was frustrated. He, said, he was thinking, this is not for me, this is not for me. And then one night in the dream, Vishwanath, Lord Shiva, appeared in his dream. And Vishwanath said, my dear Brahmin, get out of here. He said, my instruction to you is to immediately go to Mathura. He said, when you go to the land of Vrindavan, all of your desires will become fulfilled. So then, he next went to Banaras, and excuse me, next went to Prayag, and I'll tell you about Prayag tomorrow morning. Hare Krishna. Shubhadarki. Thank you, Maharaj. For anyone who's uh, inclined to take their understanding of Biha Bhagavatam Rita further, there are sets for sale here for $50, three volume sets. Um, so please do catch one of those. We're going to serve Prashadam now up at the, um, uh, up at the main temple. Everybody take the books. Three volumes, $50. It's a priceless treasure. Take it. Uh, please be back promptly at 10 a.m. for the um, Kirtan Mela to begin again. Uh, this morning's Kirtaniers, we have Balaram Tirtha at 10 o'clock, Badahari Prabhu at 11 o'clock, Indudumna Maharaj at 12 o'clock, and Bibi Govinda Maharaj at 1 o'clock. So please be punctual. <laughs>